All right, folks, I'm extremely excited to get started with reloading 762 by 39. We're going to be starting with my SKS, and I hope you saw the last video. I shot the first five rounds through the gun. It's a, it's a Chinese SKS from 1967 that was in Cosmoline, so got it all cleaned up. Chamber was rusty and pitted, so got that cleaned up a little bit, and it seems to be running okay. So the goal in today's video is just to see if it will shoot a group. I haven't really bought that much stuff specifically for 762 by 39 all of the powders that are most popular in this cartridge i already have them mainly from shooting 300 blackout powders like accurate 1680 and other very similar powders like uh, cfe black or shooters world blackout seem to be extremely popular there's reloader 7 vitivory in 120 and down to slower stuff like h335 or something like hodgton benchmark with heavy bullets tons and tons of powders that should work for us. On the bullet side of things, I picked up 300 of these. Now this 123 grain full metal jacket, like it's on Hornady's site, but don't really see it for sale many places. I think it's only available in big quantities and then some places break it down into smaller quantities for easier retail sale. I'm not sure, but I got 300 of these and I also got uh, four or five boxes of the 123 grain spear gold dot. I have had a lot of success with these bullets in other cartridges, so I think these are going to be awesome. Like, I haven't even opened a package, and I can already tell you this would be my first choice for like a deer bullet in this gun. So, happened to catch them in stock, bought them direct from spear. And these, I'm, I'm, we're not going to be shooting these today. I want to wait and make sure this gun is capable of shooting a decent group before we uh, waste any of these. Because that's the thing, this is not going to end here with the SKS. I saw someone in the comments mentioned they were surprised I didn't build an AR upper and we probably are going to do that. We'll play with the SKS for a while but once we kind of get it shooting the way we want it or give up on getting it to shoot, definitely not going to be done with the cartridge. I want to move on to an AK or an AR upper. So this is this is a long-term commitment here on the channel. This is not going to be a short-term series. We'll be covering lots of stuff eventually but yeah the, the spear gold dots might stay in the box until we we're on the next gun. I don't know. We'll see how this one shoots. So as far as 310 diameter bullets, that's all I've got. The Hornady's and the Gold Dots. But from messing around with my Mosins, I've got some larger diameter bullets. I've got some 311s. These are 174s. I've got some other 174s that are 312. And I've got some 150s that are 312. I think fitting the bullet to the bore is going to be critical here in this gun. It was it's definitely critical in my Mosins. Like the, those 312 bullets were absolutely the best shooters in my Mosins. And, you know, 308 bullets just don't shoot very good. Very similar situation here. I guess I guess I never really, you know, kind of mentioned what's normal, right? So 310 is the normal bullet diameter for 762 by 39. But, you know, the AR upper we were just talking about building, that may come with a 308 grooved barrel for shooting 308 bullets. Or it might come with a 310. You got to know what size your bore is before you even really get started. So I slugged the bore in this gun uh, using some black powder round balls. I've got two sizes. I've got a, a 0.315 and a 0.375. There, Hornady also makes a 0.350. I wish I wish I had a box of those. But I started with the 315 and put those through the bore and got almost no markings. You know, the, the rifling made its cuts, but the groove was not imprinted on the ball. So I switched to the, to the bigger 375 round balls and got that print I was after. Now with the 375, th these are pure lead. So extremely soft, basically sat one on the crown and then hammered it in with a, with a soft hammer, like a rubber mallet until it flattens off. Then you start to drive it down through the bore. So these 375s left, left this big ring of lead that sheared off. So a little bit big for the job, but it worked. So what I've found with these, measuring them about 4 million times in 4 million different spots, is that they both show 312. So I have my doubts about how well this, this gun's going to shoot even 310 bullets, let alone 308s. We'll get there eventually. I mean, we'll try it, especially if today's results are pretty good with the bigger bullets. But I think this gun's going to like the big ones. Now, you know, there's some serious safety concerns here. If you've got a 308 bore and try and shoot 312 bullets, I suspect you're going to run into pressure problems pretty quick. So just a little warning. Before you go trying to match anything that I'm doing, just make sure you know what size bore you've got and slug it and be smart about your, you know, your bullet diameter choices. Now for primers, we're going to start out with CCI number 200s. Now this gun, I've got it cleaned up really, really nicely and the firing pins floating the way it's supposed to be and all of that. But everybody does seem to love to talk about slam fires with SKSs and hopefully the CCIs will be a hard option that will discourage that. Like I said, my gun's clean. I think, I think we fine with primers anyway. Now for brass, I did manage to pick up a hundred pieces of new PPU brass. 
I found it at Graphs and they were 44 cents a piece. I also bought 500 pieces of, of once fired dirty brass from one of these brass outfits. Now, when I bought like seven months ago, I got them for 27 bucks a hundred, but right now they're on there for 43 bucks a hundred. So the price shot way up and you can actually buy brand new Starline brass cheaper than you can buy that stuff from those people now. So I, maybe their, their prices just move a lot depending on their stock or something. I don't know. If I was buying today, I, I would buy from Starline and, and they're about hundred bucks for 250 pieces, which is a little cheaper than I paid for the, the, for the PPU and it's cheaper than what the, the ones fired this or this particular once fired company's charging right now. Somebody was telling me just the other day that they put in a back order at Starline and it got filled within just a couple days. And I had the same experience recently with some 6.5 Grendel brass where I placed a back order and it got filled very quickly. So it sounds like Starline's keeping up with production and things seem to be just getting better in general as far as component availability. So I think that's the way I would go if I was doing it today. But at this point, I've got 500 pieces of the once fired brass. I've got another 100 pieces. We're good to go for brass for a while. Now, the good thing about this once fired stuff is that I found like three quarters of it is S and B. There are a lot of other brands that I've been separating out, PMC, Fioki, PPU, but S and B is the most common and I pulled out a hundred pieces of it. These five here are the ones we shot in the last video. So I'm thinking in today's video, maybe we'll load up the rest of this tray. We'll load up 45. Now, the last thing is my dies. I did pick up a set of Redding dies. This is probably the purchase I regret the most. You know, Redding makes good dies, whatever, but th they were 65 bucks and the sizing die comes with an expander ball for 308 bullets. And it doesn't look like Redding sells a larger expander ball for shooting bigger bullets. So today we're gonna to be messing around with some expanding mandrels and crap, but I ain't trying to do no expanding step with SKS plinking ammo, right? I, I want to die that can just get the job done in one step. And I know that the Hornady set, which is what I've been buying mostly lately, you can buy the 310 expander separately, I believe, and RCBS, it comes with both. So, so we may eventually get a, a different set of dies. If I knew that I wasn't going to get around to this until August, I could have just taken my time and gotten whatever I wanted. But at the time, that was all I could find. So here are the loads I want to shoot today. It's all going to be in S and B brass. It's all going to be CCI 200 primers. So I want to load up 25 rounds with the, it's the same load that I shot in the last video. So the 123 grain Hornady full metal jacket at 2.2 inches, which puts the cantaloupe on those at just about the perfect spot and 22.0 grains of accurate 1680. Pretty light load, but it was able to function the gun, no problem at all. And with this old gun, like I'm, I'm not shooting for high velocity. I'm not shooting for anything other than the best accuracy we can get just out of curiosity. And if there's none there to be found, just a nice safe load that I can go out and shoot the gun occasionally and have fun with it and have long brass life. Everybody's telling me that this stuff, the, an SKS will be tearing up brass. And if we can keep charge weights low to avoid that, I'm, I'm all for it. Now for the next load, I want to shoot the 150 grain interlock with reloader seven. And it's going to be 22.0 grains with that as well. And the last load with the 174, I want to shoot Hodgton benchmark and we'll shoot 24.0 grains. This load actually comes out of the comments section of the last video. Somebody mentioned that this bullet, the 174 grain Sierra, that's a 311 shot really well in his rifle with 24 grains of benchmark. So we'll try that bullet in a future video, but today I want to try the 312 since I think it'll fit a little bit better. And I double checked. Now I did double check that load at a, at a couple sources. There is some benchmark data. Let me see. Hold on. It's not in the Hornady manual. Now Spear has got load data for the gold dot and they do have benchmark, but with the much lighter 123 grain bullet, I mean, it's up, the max charge is 31.9. Hang on, maybe it was the Hodgson site. Nope, Hodgson only shows it for the 108 grain bullet. Oh, it was Sierra. It was Sierra. That's it. Yep. It was Sierra and it was with their 174 grain 308 bullet. They show a max charge of 26.1. So I, th I think 24 is going to be okay. That's another thing. Whenever you go looking for load data, most of the load data is developed with 308 bullets or some places like Hornady, they've got data for both. So, you know, as, as a new person getting into this cartridge for the first time, there, there's a lot to navigate here. You know, on top of the normal confusion of whenever you're looking at all of your load data sources, 
resources and trying to build your confidence that the load's not going to blow your face off, that added element of bullet diameter just makes things a little bit more nerve wracking. But you know, not a big deal. You just gotta, you just gotta think things through, maybe be a little bit more careful and make smart choices. So I think that's it. Like, uh, yeah, have we talked about what we need to talk about? I think we have. Now this brass has been cleaned in the ultrasonic cleaner. Hopefully you saw that video. The main goal of that was to make it so that I could look down and easily spot the bird and primers whenever I was sorting these. And it worked great for that, but they're also, you know, pretty darn clean. I'm totally happy with this level of cleanliness for my sizing operation. So let's go ahead and start sizing. After we lube, of course, I'm just gonna hit these guys with some Hornady one shot. So I get a lot of questions about the Redding T7. It's been a while since I've since I've loaded with it. So I figured I'd pull it out for today. Still love the press. Now with this brass, I'm not trying to get cute. I mentioned it is, it's all uh, S and B brass, but it was fired in God knows what, or God knows how many different things. So I want to re resize these cases as fully as I can. So I'm going to crank this down until it touches, maybe just a little bit farther. Yeah, we'll call that good right there. Then we can start. Tell you what, the die is sizing this brass pretty dang hard. Or a lot of work's going on here. Some of them don't seem too bad, but every once in a while I'll definitely get one that comes out kind of like this. You can see a lot of uh, a lot of body sizing went on there, right down there to the last little bit the die can hit. So that, you know, that that's exactly why I just didn't want to try and get cute with the with the die set up here when I don't know the history of the brass. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, whenever I said that, I probably should have been a little bit more descriptive about what I'm talking about. But what, you know, with a lot of reloading, I try to size the brass as little as possible. So sometimes the sizing die isn't screwed all the way down as far as it can go. Sometimes it's up off a little bit and sizes the brass less. As long as it fits in your gun, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. Yeah, there, there's a tough one right there. Let me show you guys the expander ball in this die. There we go. So you see, so that one portion there, right through here, is what sets the inside diameter of our neck. As the brass is, you know, coming down out of the die, this is pulling through the neck and it sets that final, that final size of the neck. And they're generally right about two thousandths under your bullet diameter. Yeah, this is reading a half thousandths bigger than that. If I measured a little bit closer with a little better instrument for the job, might come up with something better, but yeah, right about one and a half, two thousandths under our final bullet diameter. Now, if this was the RCBS kit and it also came with a different expander for larger bullets, we would just screw this off, screw on the right one, and we'd be off and running. In this case, with the reading, we're screwed. But I have a full set of expanding mandrels for 308. You'll see this one right here is 0 0.3090. And I've got another one here that is 0 0.3080. So what I want to do is I want to use the 308 expander on the brass we're going to load with 310 bullets. And I want to use the 309 on the ones we're going to shoot the 312 bullets. Unfortunately, I don't have a 310 expander. This 30 this .3090 is the biggest one I've got for 30 cal. So it'll just have to do. And it's pretty close. It's a heck of a lot better than 306 or whatever, you know, our expander mandrel is in there. So these little expanders just drop down inside of this uh, body. These are made by 21st century. So let's start with the 308 and it's important to to lube these, I'm gonna use a little bit of uh, Redding Imperial Size and Dye Wax. Just get a nice little starter coat on there. I did get the Hornady one shot down in the neck of each case, so I think they'll be just fine. Just like that. And we need a lock ring. All right, so I just put it down in there far enough to where the neck should get fully up onto the expander. It's actually probably gonna go a little too far maybe. Nope, that's good. All right. Okay, so I need 25 pieces with this first expander, then I'll switch over and do 20 pieces with the other.
Couple notes on brass prep before I move on to primers and powder. Sometimes I use this tool to clean primer pockets. It's actually, so it's a, it's a Lyman primer pocket depth cutter. Now most brass already comes with the primer pockets the correct depth, so I usually just use it to, to scrape out fouling when I'm not tumbling brass. Well I started to do it with these and it starts cutting a bunch of brass. Like all of the primer pockets were too deep. So I went ahead and just let the cutter do its thing and cut them to depth. This is not the sort of thing I want to do to my SKS brass, right? I mean that's a significant time investment for brass like this. But with the risk of slam fires and all that crap, I figured, you know what, here for the first kind of serious range trip where we're looking at accuracy, if this saves us from having confusing slam fires or doubles or something, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. We'll investigate later whether this helped or didn't matter. I think it probably didn't matter, but it's worth testing. I think it was, you know, I think it's worth the time. Because, you know, primers are supposed to sit a little bit below flush. You, you rub your finger over, you shouldn't feel a big hump. So maybe next video we'll, you know, we'll see some primers on ones we didn't do this to and see if it's, if it's pronounced enough to worry about or not. Probably not. Otherwise, pretty straightforward, just trimmed them to length. Uh, I would say 75% didn't need trimmed, but there was maybe 10% that needed trimmed a bunch. So a little bit all over the place. And I deburred and chamfered the, the case mouth. Now, I only did the outside on my Frankfurt Arsenal case prep center because I wanted to use, uh, you know, one of the stubby shorter ones instead of the, you know, the big long VLD style, they call it now. I didn't want to cut such a drastic angle in these. So yeah, I went ahead and used this just by hand. It also gave me another opportunity to feel each, each neck and feel for splits because that's another thing that happened in the last video. I had a neck split and you guys were sharp. You noticed it in the picture of the rounds before I fired them. So that neck was split before it ever fired. But I know it wasn't split whenever I chamfered the case mouth because it's normally very obvious. Like if you get one that it just won't seem to smooth up or there's just one, one spot that it's usually a split in the neck. So I think that neck split happened during bullet seating, which is why I did the crazy stuff with the expanders and stuff to try and get these hopefully to seat a little bit smoother. Because in that picture, you could also see like the necks were all weird and bulgy where, you know, I had seated that larger bullet down into that case that was expecting 308 bullets. So hopefully that's all fixed today. Now, one really good thing is the primer pockets in all of this brass seem very tight. I pulled out the, the primer pocket go no-go gauge and even the go side, which uh, yeah, that's the go side. Like that is a tight fit on the go side. Ugh, can't even get it to go all the way down. And the, you know, the no-go is no hope whatsoever. All right, let's hope bullet seating goes a little bit smoother this time. I can't imagine it wouldn't. Let's put one of my cases in there and raise the ram. I'm gonna drop the bullet seating die until I feel the, the crimp touch the case mouth. That's it right about there. And I'm gonna come off of that about a half turn and then tighten my lock ring. Now with the Hornady full metal jacket, I've got a cantaloupe as a target. Yeah, just the way that's sitting in there, I can already tell that it's going to see a lot easier than my last try. Okay, I've got it started. Got a pretty good little ways to go there. A little bit more. And maybe just a touch more. I'll tighten that down, we'll get a measurement. This is 2.220 and the can lure is sitting just a little bit higher than we'd like. So let me try and go down about 20 thousandths. Perfect, close enough, 2.199. So we're gonna call that good. That's what my alignment looks like. Double, double check, make sure everything's tight. And I think we're good. See how this one feels. Oh yeah, yeah, that's seating so smooth. You get so much feedback on the reloading process during the bullet seating step like even okay my last time where i suspect that that neck split during this process like i think if that happened to me right now where i've got like you know 
our, our bullet seating is going really smooth and it's feeling the same every time. If that happened to me today, I think I would catch it. You know, last time trying to squeeze these big bullets in those little necks, there was just so much force going on and it felt so weird that I didn't get that good, you know, that good feedback like I like to feel during bullet seating. Now I don't have a crimping die, but you know, and we could have been crimping while we were seating here, but I, I really don't like doing that. That's never, like I've never been able to wrap my head around being able to crimp at the same time that bullet is, you know, finishing its movement into its final position. So I, I just never crimp and seat at the same time, but we can use this seating die just for crimp. You know, we just back out the seating stem or I mean, you can remove it. And I, I already know I, I've, I locked down this die about a half turn off of the case mouth, so I can go ahead and put the loaded round in there, crack the die loose, and then if I go down about a half turn, I should feel it hit the case right about there. And then let's drop the case and mm, let's try a quarter of a turn first. That didn't seem to do too much. There's a little bit less than a half. That felt like too much. <laughs> that felt like too much. Actually, it may not be too bad. I wonder if it messed with our overall length at all. Next one, we'll, we'll do a before and after. It'll be at 2.199. So this next one before is 2.1985. Crimp it. Yeah, now it went to 2.1975. We're a little heavy on the crimp here. Let's let's back her off just a smidge. There we go. Backed it off about an eighth of a turn. See how that feels. Like I I can feel it. You know, like you can everything in reloading. You can feel. You know, it's all about feel. I forgot to measure that last one before. All right, this one's actually two point two one zero. Hmm. How'd that get ten thousandths long? Let me see if there's any others that are like that. Two point two zero three. 2.203. Yeah, I'm not really sure what sort of consistency to expect out of these bullets. All right, this one 2.203 before and 2.203 after. So that's still a good, healthy, visible, wow, that sure is crimped sort of look, but it's not disturbing our seating depth. I think these are the only ones we'll crimp. The other 20, we won't. I'm just not much of a crimp guy anymore. I used to crimp a lot more than I do these days. So now things are about to get interesting. Our 150 grain interlock, it's also got a can lure, but it, it may not be at an appropriate spot for this cartridge, right? But then again, it might be. So now the Hornady manual does show their, their uh, 308 diameter interlock in here, and they show 2.2 inch overall length. So maybe with this one, we can get pretty much where we need to be. All right, this, so this is the first test of our, of our bigger expander and the three, uh, 312 bullets. All right, let's reset our seating die. Get one of these guys started. It's already hitting something. Oh, okay, I think, I think my bullet just got a little bit wonky up in there. But, you know, flat base bullets, getting them started is a, an adventure sometimes. All right, I finally got that bullet started, but it did not want to start. I didn't dig up any copper shavings or anything, so like it, it, it started okay. Hmm. Weird. See, we're all the way out at 2.385, so we've got 185 thousandths to go. All right, let's go ahead and get it down to the proper length. May have already gone too far. <laughs> nope, I haven't. We're, so that's 2.278, 2.277, and we've already gone past our can lure, but not by much. We may end up uh, being able to shoot these longer, but I'll tell you what, th these we'll go ahead and just set to 2.2 2 inches. The next bullet, the 174, we're probably gonna have more troubles with it as far as getting it short enough. And well, we've run out of seating die adjustment. So my seating stem is bottomed out. You got a couple options in that situation. I'm gonna back it off. I, I don't want it all the way bottomed out because I don't know you know if that might mess up the alignment so I'm backing it off of where it's bottomed out just a smidgen let's see where that puts us we may just go ahead and shoot this length because I think we're we're within 30 or 40 thousandths yeah 2.238 let's just go with it because you know the other option would be 
to put an empty case back in there and then lower the die as much as possible without the crimp ring interfering and then you know that would give us a little bit more adjustment to work with but I think we're good I want to see the second one and then I want to make sure these fit down in the magazine of the gun and look like they're going to feed I'm such a freaking idiot look what I just did I just seated one of the 123s because this stupid little bag of bullets was still sitting here crap so I was just looking in the manual it looks like 22 grains of reloader 7 is just like they show their starting charge is 21.9. So this is way underpowered and its overall length is super short. I think I'm just gonna shoot it. It's not worth time, it's not worth the time to try and fix it. So okay, let's <laughs> let's hopefully get back on track here. See if this one starts a little bit easier. Oof, man. That felt a little bit wonky as well. Let's feel a third one. I think it's a mixture of, you know, the, the flat base bullet and alignment. But then also, if you remember, I didn't quite have an expander big enough. So for these, it was 3 thousandths under bullet diameter rather than two. So maybe that's the additional force I'm feeling. All right, I got the gun here. Let me see if these are gonna, are gonna fit. Wow, they won't. They are absolutely dragging the nose here at the front of the magazine. How about that? I guess 2.2 is just all you get. I guess we're back to that second option I was talking about. So let's put an empty case in here, drop the die until it's touching the case mouth right there. And then that's where we'll, that's where we'll seat them to. Back the stem out just a smidgen. See what that got us. I think that's just about close enough. 2.204, yeah, 2.198, 2.195, and 2.204. Close enough. They'll definitely fit in the gun now. Now those longer ones that were dragging the nose in the magazine, they were, uh, they did go up in the chamber and it went into battery no problem, so. All right, hopefully things don't get crazy here with this 174 grainer. I'm gonna leave the die set where it is, where you know, that crimp is right at the case mouth. And I've got the adjustment way back out. Okay. Now this bullet's a boat tail and it is seating just smooth as silk. So I think with this load, I'm probably, we might be a little bit compressed. I don't think it's gonna to be too bad though. Let's see what our overall length here is. So I'm currently at 2.252. So we've only got 50 thousandths to go and I'm still feeling some powder moving. So this is gonna, sounds like it might be just about a perfectly full case, just lightly compressed down to 2.232. All right, I think we're where we need to be. 2.201, you know, that, that ogive of the bullet is starting right at that case mouth, but I don't think any of the ogive is below, yeah, below the mouth. Man, that's just, that's just a handsome looking round right there. I like that. Let's see if the next one, see if it, comes out about right. Let's see if we can feel the crunch in this one. Yep, just, just a little crunch there at the end. Just a nice full case. That one's 2.205, 2.204. Good, we're good to go. All right, last one. Good deal. Let's go get out on the range. So I think I'm set up and ready to go. One thing I did wanna mention was that I removed the rear sling swivel. Yep, removed that guy so it would ride the rear bag a little bit easier. And I think I've got a pretty good setup here, as long as I keep from banging up the front of my magazine. Got the lab radar to get our velocities, and the shot marker electronic target system is at 100 yards. And the target on the screen is the one we're actually using. It's the NRA SR1. The black part in the middle is about the size of your palm, or you know, your hand, maybe a little bit smaller than that. Now for the first shot, to check the shot marker and make sure our lab radar is working. Let's use this seating mistake I made where it's the 123 grain bullet with the light load of reloader seven. Let's see if it hits the paper. We may need to come closer. I was going to start at 50, but the, the shot marker makes it so much easier that hopefully, hopefully we're on target. Let's see. Okay, velocity was 1905 and looks like we hit the paper. Sweet. 
All right, let's move on to some real stuff. I'm gonna load up five of our first load with the 123s and 22 grains of accurate 1680. How'd we do? Well, dang, heck yeah, that's not bad. 2.56 inches. I am definitely, like I, you know, there's no way I'm holding much better than that. Yeah, that's very promising. I'll tell you what we'll do so we can track like the shifting point of impact between our different bullets. Let's move this group over to the dead center of the target. Kind of use it as our 123 baseline. We can go calibrate and then drag that over. You guys probably can't even see it. Yeah, you can. All right, we'll call that good. Sweet, now they're all in 10 ring. And I guess that means we could zoom in a little bit. What about velocity, I hear you say? So our average was 1,898 feet per second. The standard deviation was 35.5 and the extreme spread was 90. So very slow and pretty crappy standard deviation numbers, but that's no big deal. All right, let's shoot five more. Let's make this a 10 shot group. Well, it looks like I kind of sprayed them all over the place there a little bit, didn't I? So we're up to a 5.85 inch group. Let's see what it was without number 10. Let's hide it. So the other nine shots went into 4.38 inches. What about our best eight? We'll just keep we'll just keep removing them until the group looks good. Yeah, the best eight were 4.38. Bit of horizontal dispersion going on there. That's got to be me. I'm having a hard time. I need to get some new glasses, but I'm having a hard time getting that front side post perfectly centered in the uh, in the rear. So that doesn't surprise me to see that. I'll tell you what, all in all, I'm kind of okay with this. Yeah, that's not bad at all. I think I've got the bullet holes set to too small. Yeah, there we go. Switch it to 308 bullet holes. Doesn't change anything, just makes the makes the dot about the right size. All right, so let's save this one and clear our target. I need to run down all this brass. Okay, next I want to move on to the 150 grain Hornady interlock. Remember this is a 312 bullet, 22 grains of reloader seven. So the first muzzle velocity was 1865 and I ran down the piece of brass and it looks awesome. And I'm so excited about like the fact that we can have low velocity, good looking brass and the gun still cycling. I was afraid this was going to be a gun that really needed to be run hot or be super picky about powders. It seems to be extremely forgiving. All right, let's see if these 312s will shoot a group. Uh-oh, where'd that fourth shot go? 
Oh, look, lost it up high. You know, it makes me wonder, right before I took my fifth shot, I kind of had to make a pretty pretty drastic bag adjustment. I'm wondering if that, yeah, that fourth shot just, I just didn't put it where I needed to put it. What were we shooting without it? Yeah, the other four went into 1.9 inches. How about that? Down on the target end, it shows a good standard deviation number. Let's see what we got up here at the muzzle. Yeah, pretty good here as well. Average was 1882, standard deviation of 12.7, and an extreme spread of 30. So I've got four more of these. Let's go ahead and shoot them. Also good to see, you know, no feeding issues with the soft point bullet. the first five all right so those are the four shots I just took 2.88 inches I did clean up my you know my horizontal dispersion there and that was kind of what I was focusing on more was that alignment maybe this time you know I just I've let my front side post drift a little higher into the black you know any of these guns like you know your first couple range range outings it's getting used to the sights and finding your finding your magic sight picture that just works for you and is repeatable and i'm definitely not there yet all right what was our overall group size yeah nine shots into 3.72 inches i'm not going to complain too much about that so with this last load the 174 grain hornady uh, bowtail hollow point with 24 grains of benchmark. I wanna go ahead and just load the gun all the way. We'll see how it feeds from a full magazine. 10 rounds. Okay, that velocity was 1795 and the piece of brass just happened to land right in front of me. And it looks great as well. how we do well it's not terrible Did that seven shot make it into the black oh yeah so they're all in the black that's got to count for something it's funny to kind of watch how the shots move around because i think okay so that fourth shot is the one where i was high i bet i kind of knew i was high and after that shot readjusted bags and side alignment and everything and then dropped all the way down here for a couple shots and then slowly crept back up. I, I think this is marksmanship. I think a lot of this is just, I need to get used to this gun. I need to get used to these sights. I need to get to the freaking optometrist. So, you know, 5.2 inch group, but man, I'm kind of like totally good with it. So the velocity with those 174s was 1786, standard deviation of 19.3, and extreme spread of 68. So what we've got left are 15 rounds of the original 123 load. What I'd like to do is go back and shoot one more group with these guys. 
kind of focus on my marksmanship and see if I can improve on the groups we shot earlier. And then I think the next, the other 10, I'll just leave them as ciders for the next video. Here we go. All right, how'd we do? Okay, so 3.74 inches. Yeah, we didn't really improve, but that's okay. I'm feeling good about the gun. A whole lot better than I felt after I saw that rusty chamber for the first time. So I would say let's get back to the bench, but there's not a whole lot to talk about. I guess I could give you guys a look at some of the brass. So the first thing you'll notice when you look at the box of brass is these four rows over here have got black crap on them and these are all nice and shiny. Well, these were our 123 grain bullets with the light load of Accurate 1680, and we got quite a bit of fouling on the side of our cases and a little bit on the head. That, that load clearly wasn't sealing the chamber. You know, pressure wasn't quite high enough on that one. Over here with the 150 and 174, none of that. We're picking up some uh, shiny spots. Just trying to see if I could find one with a good shiny spot on it. I am picking up some uh, shiny spots on the side, but. It's not deep at all. So just cosmetic, some of these dings. Now these are a little bit more serious. Like that's a little bit of a burr there. And I'm wondering if that's normal because I spotted that on a lot of the once fired brass. So maybe that's an SKS thing. Like the, the brass isn't ruined. It shouldn't really be a big deal. A little bit of marking on the case head of some of them, but you know, not bad at all. Definitely reloadable brass, definitely light loads with rounded primers, no pierced primers, no weird cratering. And I didn't notice any split necks either. So hopefully it was just that one, that one case in the last video that was an outlier. So I think that's where we leave it, folks. My next video probably will be on something else, but we'll be back to 762 by 39 really, really soon. So thanks for joining me. See you next time.